Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Khaldun Azhari. I'm moderator of this event, member of the club, and former president. I'm very glad to see you today, although it's raining hard, but uh, it seems this topic of the event is very important for you and for everybody, especially at this time of the year. We are preparing for the Olympics, but uh, we invited the three uh, very uh, distinguished guests to talk about uh, the so-called No Olympics movements. Let me introduce them to my very right is Miss Anne Orkier. She is the organizing member of the No Olympics LA, and she is former sport, of course. And to her right is uh, Mr. Uh, Julius Boykov. He is uh, also. U.S. Uh, Olympian, and he's author of uh, Celebration, Capitalism, and the Olympic Games. And to his right is Ms. Misako Ichimura. She is member of the uh, Hong Hangurin No Kai No Olympics 2020. And uh, today they will talk about the No Olympics uh, movements, and uh, they uh, they will tell us some uh, information and details about the uh, negative aspects of the Olympics. Uh, and uh, especially at uh, uh, different uh, levels, uh, there are some costs related and uh, also uh, restrictions on the use of public transportation. That's not only in the Olympics, that's also in the summit, actually, as to what happened in Osaka recently. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today uh, we will uh, have uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, of time for each speaker, and that will be followed by Q&A. And uh, I think they will speak in English, except Misago-san, she will speak in Japanese and will be translated to English. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest speakers today. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm extremely grateful to be with you here today. I come to you having dedicated more than a decade of my life researching and writing about the Olympic Games. Before that, I had the good fortune of representing the U.S. Olympic soccer team in international competition. So I come to you today with the perspective of the athlete worker in mind as well. I lived in Rio de Janeiro in the lead up to the 2016 Games and I was there for the Olympics as well. I also lived in London and England in the lead up to the 2012 Olympics and I lived there for the Olympics too. So I have a ground eye view of the two most recent summer games as they approached in that moment that we're in right now, in fact. When a city decides to host the Olympics, they also decide to import a number of problems. Problems that are not disputed by social science research. One of those is overspending. The Olympics bring etch-a-sketch economics, by which the initial price tag gets erased and then multiplied many times, typically at the cost of public money. Another trend is displacement. The working poor and marginalized tend to get displaced to make way for Olympic venues and infrastructure. A third trend we've seen, Olympics after Olympics, is the militarization of public space. The government uses the opportunity to get all the weapons that they would never be able to get during normal political times, all of the special laws that they would never be able to get during normal political times. And those weapons, those laws, stay on the books in the wake of the games and become part of everyday policing for everyday people in the Olympic City. A fourth trend is what in the United States we call greenwashing which means making big, grand environmental promises, but not necessarily following through. So walking the green, or sorry, talking the green talk, but not walking the green walk, if you will. A fifth trend is corruption. With all the money that is sloshing through the Olympic system, corruption has become a serious problem. And I say that as somebody who comes from the United States where we experienced this very directly in the bidding for the Salt Lake City Olympics in 2002. Yesterday, I went to Fukushima. It was one of the most intense experiences of my life, something I will never forget. 
Being there, it was obvious that the prefecture still needs massive support to make things right. To return to Tokyo afterwards and think about all the money being plunged into the Olympics while people still suffer in Fukushima was mind-blowing for me. And I feel like I'm still processing that experience. In Fukushima, I met amazingly courageous people who are doing the very best they can under extreme circumstances. I met a local official, an elected official, and asked her what she thought of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's comment back in 2013 when he was trying to get the Olympics to come to Tokyo that everything was under control. She told me, and this is a quote from her, things were absolutely not under control and nothing is over yet. The nuclear radiation is still very high. Only one small section, she said, was being cleaned. The wider region still includes evacuation zones. There's still radiation in the area. She said, meanwhile, we're still having an Olympics. I stand with that brave elected official, and I believe her voice needs to be included in the Olympic conversation. I stand with those who are willing to speak up and challenge the downsides of the Olympic Games. The concerns that they raise are valid and they're grounded in the recent political history of the Olympics. So as the Olympics approach, I very much look forward to seeing how journalists, including those in this room, are able to widen the aperture of public discussion. To think about those who cannot afford to buy a ticket to the Olympics, but who nevertheless will be affected by the Olympic Games. Serious grievances churn beneath the surface, the shiny, shimmering surface of the Olympics, and they absolutely deserve our collective attention. So I look forward to that conversation with you today, and if I can be any of assistance beyond today, please do let me know. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Anne Orchier. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm an organizer with No Olympics LA, which is a coalition of uh, over 25 organizations throughout the state of California, um, primarily based in LA. And just want to say that um, we're incredibly grateful to be here. Thank you to our hosts, Hongar and Okai, and, and thank you to uh, everyone who's also joining us from uh, South Korea and from France, uh, who are also in this room. So I'll be reading a statement on behalf of No Olympics LA. Two years ago, when No Olympics LA initially formed, one of the things we consistently heard from Olympic boosters and politicians was, LA is not Rio. But one of the things we've always insisted and have traveled several thousand miles with organizers from our coalition to say is that LA is in many ways just like Rio, and that our struggles are deeply connected. From the criminalization of poverty carried out by an increasingly militarized, violent, and overfunded police force to a rapidly deteriorating democracy. In each of our cities, the Olympics don't cause these problems, but they directly exacerbate all of them. And in LA, we have many problems that demand our city's resources and attention, and that should take priority over a bloated spectacle like the Olympics. Problems that threaten to make our city uninhabitable to anyone but the super elite. Last month, we learned that homelessness in the city of LA has risen 16% in the last year, which is a conservative estimate. There are currently at least 60,000 people experiencing homelessness on any given night in Los Angeles. We have one of the biggest economies in the world, and there are 60 billionaires who live in our city, so it's not a question of resources. For example, Casey Wasserman, the chair of LA 2028, recently listed his home for $125 million. That's the most expensive home ever sold in Los Angeles, while an average of 150 people become homeless in LA every single night. The same group who is fighting to bring the Olympics to LA is the same group who fought to bring the Olympics to Rio, and their goal is to intentionally displace entire communities for profit. In LA, we're already see seeing this play out nine years in advance, as entire buildings are being demolished near Olympic venues to satisfy a manufactured hotel shortage. Hotel shortage in scare quotes, it's not real. It's not an accident that these are rent-controlled units, which is the last form of housing that working class families in LA can afford. Just like it's not an accident that favelas were raised in Rio and public housing is under attack here in Tokyo. 
they're not bulldozing mansions to build luxury hotels or stadiums. They're going after the most vulnerable. This process is designed to benefit the already wealthy and powerful, and the people being most negatively affected have no input. The Olympic bidding and organizing process is fundamentally anti-democratic, and there is no mandate in LA for hosting the 2028 Summer Games. It's no coincidence that Rio, Pyeongchang, LA, and Tokyo have had zero opportunities to vote. Most people in LA don't even know the Olympics are coming. In Olympics LA conducted our own survey in 2018 because the media in LA has refused to conduct any public polling. We found that 45% of Angelinos were opposed to hosting the 2028 Olympics. 35% believe that bringing the Olympics to LA would worsen their own lives. And a full 51% of respondents were moderately or extremely concerned about the impact of the Olympics on LA's homelessness crisis. A mere 1% of people said they were following the bidding process closely. We think that's by design because the details of the bid are frightening and it's in LA 2028's best interest for people not to pay attention. One of the things they've been keeping quiet is the National Special Security Event designation of the Olympics, or the NSSE, which mandates the creation of a unified command between federal and local law enforcement. What that means in practice is that the Department of Homeland Security and the various agencies under its umbrella, including ICE and CBP, will have unprecedented access to the LAPD and LA Sheriff's Department's data, personnel, and other billions of dollars worth of resources. These are the same groups responsible for the thousands of concentration camps at our country's border, which presents a terrifying risk to the hundreds of thousands of undocumented and mixed status families in LA. LA already has the deadliest police force in America, and the Olympics gives them even more power to harass, incarcerate, and murder. We're days away from the 35th anniversary of the 1984 Olympics, which deepened the militarization of the LAPD and provided the groundwork for the injustices leading to the 92 uprising, also known as the 92 riots. We do not want to repeat this ugly, violent history. In reality, not much has changed since 92. These communities are still experiencing the effects of violence and inequity. They haven't been empowered or redeveloped. They've largely been erased, and the Olympics presents an opportunity to complete the project of erasure. We reject this Olympic endgame. The Olympics always sell the promise of a clean, peaceful urban future. We, on the other hand, organize in the present around people's lived realities and concerns and needs. <clears throat> Our goal isn't just to push the Olympics out of LA or even out of every city. We want to challenge and ultimately destroy the systems and global networks of power that are the true drivers behind the Olympic movement, which is designed to protect the status quo and is therefore no movement at all. We are building power today among the people who have been denied input and autonomy over their own lives and communities. In the same way that an Olympics LA has been a collective effort of dozens of local organizations, we've traveled here today to help grow this coalition internationally. Thank you. Thank you. So, so. I'm Misapu Ichimura, uh, Hangorin no Kai, the No Olympic Committee of Japan. Tomorrow, 24th of July, uh, just one year before the opening ceremony of uh, Tokyo Olympics, we will have an uh, international anti Olympics demonstration in order to cultivate international solidarity. そして今日、え、この場にも来ている、え、2016年リオ、え、2018年ピョンチャン、2022年パリ、そして2018年ロサンゼルスの、え、各都市からオリンピックに反対する仲間とオリンピックを終わらせるために国際連帯表明を、あ
2013年9月オリンピックが東京に決定して以来私たちはオリンピックは単なるスポーツ大会ではないことを見せつけられました。Since September 2 2013, when the Olympics will be held in Tokyo, we have seen that the, sports,、uh, the Olympics is not just a sports event. The whole budget is、uh, now seems to.、Uh, Amounts to、uh, 30 billion dollars, and the huge amounts of public funds、uh, flows into、uh, the hu huge corporates, whereas the poor are、uh, evicted and excluded and marginalized. Olympic is for us a dangerous entertainment. The Olympics for us is scary entertainment. The Olympics for us is scary entertainment. オリンピックにふさわしいスタピジアムにするために1490億円もの巨額費用をかけて拡張工事が行われています。東京の新しいスタジアム、which is under construction, uh, uh, in order to build this、uh, huge amount of money,、uh, um, I say 1.5 billion dollars are used and in order to extend and rebuild that. そのせいで、都営霞ヶ丘アパート2300世帯が立ち退かされ、明治公園からは野宿の人たちが強制排除されました。Due to this construction,、uh, about 230 households are forced to evict from、uh, the city run apartment called 霞ヶ丘 and Uh, a number of homeless people were forced to evict from, forced to、uh, leave from the、uh, Meiji Park. Olympic In the construction site for the Olympics, already three、uh, construction workers、uh, died、uh, due to the work. And、uh, many labor uh, accidents already happened, and a heat uh, stroke uh, s- uh, devours uh, them. Olympic のために住民が追い出され、人権をないがしろにし、えー、多くの樹木を切り崩し、自然環境を壊して、えー、一部スポーツ団体や大企業、ゼナコンが利権をむさぼっています。Due to the Olympics, Uh, the people、uh, living there are evicted and the human rights are infringed, and the number of trees were cut down and、uh, the natural environment、uh, is destroyed. Whereas、uh, a limited number of sports、uh, o r g a n i z a t i o n and huge corporates and construction companies get s the money. The same kind of thing have been, has been happening、uh, in every、uh, city s where Olympics have been held.、Uh, Rio, Pyeongchang, uh, Paris, and Los Angeles, 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 and 2020東京の問題はこれだけではありません。The problems of 2020 Tokyo Olympics is not, are not limited to these. 東京オリンピック招致における賄賂汚職問題をこのままうやむや、このままうやむやにするわけにはいきません。First, the issue of bribery、uh, during the inviting process、uh, is not to be forgotten. IOC 国際オリンピック委員会は2020東京開催を断念しオリンピック・パラリンピック組織委員会や JOC を徹底的に調査してすべてを明らかにするべきです。IOC should renounce 2020 Tokyo Olympics and,、uh, you know, and should establish an investigating committee、uh, for all this problem and、uh, clarify everything behind that. 過酷な真夏の東京でこのままオリンピックが開催されれば多くの人の健康被害を及ぼすでしょう
if uh, in a harsh situation in the mid summer of Tokyo, uh, the Olympics will be held uh, next year, many people will have a health damage and uh, they will suffer. <coughs> ボランティア動員や警察の過剰警備による人権侵害、住民生活への影響も深刻です。There are other problems, including mobilization of volunteers and excessive surveillance by the police and infringement of human rights and serious damage to people's lives. そして何よりも、東京オリンピックは復興五輪として、2011年の東北大震災の被害、そして、えー、福島第一、えー、原発事故による放射能被害を終わったことにしようとし、えー、被災者たちを苦しめています。Above all, the Tokyo Olympics is aimed、uh, to reconstruct and rehabilitate the scar of the Fukushima disaster. And in order to、uh, periodize the, every scar and、uh, damage、uh, due to the、uh, nuclear power plant, and they still suffer. Nihon wa ima, mada, gen shirok hi joji tai sen gen no, ni a r i m a s Japan is still under the state of emergency due to the、uh, nuclear disaster. Nothing、uh, is ending. We will not shut our mouth until Tokyo Olympics will end. そして世界中でオリンピックが終わるまで私たちは共につながり、えー、黙ることはありません。We will have a solidarity until the future Olympics will end. This is anti Olympics torch, which is handed down from Vancouver Olympics. Vancouver, so she did Sochi, London, so she did London, so she did Sochi, so she did Rio, so she did Pyongyang, so she did Ima, Tokyo, and Kono, so she did the anti Olympics torch, which is handed down from Vancouver Olympics. So the anti Olympics torch. It's handed down from、uh, Sochi,、uh, Pyongyang, Rio, and to Tokyo. And we, I have that now here.、Uh, we have to end、uh, the future Olympics, including Tokyo, now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Mr. Yutaka Yoshida, he's an interpreter today from the University of Tokyo. Of science and talking. I would like to open the floor to、uh, your questions. Please raise your hand and proceed to the front. Thank you. Haruko Watanabe,、uh, HKW Media Report. I'd like to ask you some basic question. What took you so long to come to Tokyo、mm -hmm. to present?、Uh, Your own principal speech and observation and research. Because it's kind of too late. It's in the Olympic, it's coming in one year. How can you organize or how can you stimulate anti Olympic movement and organization if you come too late? It's too late to boycott the Olympic Games, Professor Boykov. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for I'm expecting. To have a clear cut answer from all of you.、Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can, I can start. So,、uh, you know, as I mentioned in our statement, one issue in LA is that the, the bidding process has largely been kept under wraps.、Um, so, it had been very difficult to get information for a long time. I count myself among the many Angelinos who had no idea that Los Angeles was bidding. Um, I think, unlike in other cities or in past Olympics where the Olympics、uh, and the bidding process has been sold to the city and heavily advertised and propagandized, in LA it's been kept under wraps.、Um, and most people don't know that it's happening. So, when we first started talking about it, it was, it was very you know, low rumbles. 
Uh, and when we started organizing, um, as many of you may remember, the, the process uh, that happened for the LA bid was relatively unusual, um, where LA and Paris were both bidding, the last two cities bidding for 2024. Um, and the timeline, it happened very quickly where the IOC made the announcement that they were going to let both cities, you know, choose who would uh, take 2024 and who would take 2028. And that happened, I believe, on July 31st, 2017. And then the LA City Council voted uh, 11 days later. So there was a very, very quick turnaround and, and no time for, for public input. It was not something that was, was really shared with the public. These were all decisions and conversations that happened behind closed doors and then were just presented as inevitable. Um, so we've been organizing as quickly as we can. Um, the conversations about coming here to Tokyo started, I believe, about six months ago. And then since then, we've been working almost around the clock to um, you know, to raise funds and to organize uh, with the the incredible help and skill of, of Misako-san and uh, the rest of Hunger and Okai and Okatawa Link and other groups in Tokyo. Uh, but yeah, it's been a, a huge effort. Um, and I think I would also just want to add, as, uh, as Misako was mentioning, this is not just about stopping one Olympics. Uh, this is about stopping all of the Olympics and working together. And that's something we believe that we can do from, from where we're sitting right now and in an ongoing way. <clears throat> Thank you for your question. And I think it's a good one. Uh, I have, as I say, been working on this for quite a long time. And I'm not alone. There are other researchers and writers in the room who've been thinking critically about the Olympics. So I would say, first of all, uh, there's been a lot of information out there. And the evidence tends to point in the same direction, the trends that I pointed out earlier. I would have loved to have come here earlier. Absolutely. I'm not sure I necessarily needed to because there's so much information in the public sphere. And in fact, if you just stick to Japan for a moment, I know I was picking on my own country, the United States, a minute ago, uh, but the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo uh, went way over budget. You see some of the trends that I discussed even back in 1964. I picked on Salt Lake City, but 1998 Nagano Games, we don't really know the specifics on what happened there because the documents were shredded from those games. But we suspect that some of the very same corruption that I described in regards to Salt Lake City was going on with Nagano as well. So I think if we look around with a critical eye, we can find evidence of all this. But I think what really the, the bottom line of your question is, it points up, is that we are right now in the midst of a historic and unique moment. I've been studying anti-Olympics activism for a long time, and this is the first time that I've seen activists come together from around the world to create a transnational summit. Whether it should have happened a few years ago, sounds like that's what you think, and I think there's a lot of people that would agree with you, but it's definitely happening now in Tokyo, and it's happening here this week. Uh, so we, uh, our group, uh, No Olympics Committee, is active from uh, uh, September tw to 2013 when the uh, sort of uh, invitation thing was decided. Uh, when the Olympics were decided to be held in, held in Tokyo, I already could foresee that uh, the number of eviction uh, would happen, uh, not just in Tokyo, but everywhere in Japan. The reason is that the same kind of thing has been, have been happening every uh, place when, uh, where Olympics have been held. え、え、we already know that the uh, Olympics is uh, the machine that uh, destroys everything. 
、えー、2013年9月、えー、東京に決定したとき、えー、皆さんと、みんなとってもショックでした。In 2013,、uh, September, when the Olympics will be held in Tokyo,、uh, and it was decided,、uh, we were really shocked. ただそこで、そこから始まったのは、えー、もう決ま,ったとこ決まったことだから仕方がないという諦め、えー、そしてそのまま、えー、破壊がどんどん進んでいくという状況でした。Uh, but the same thing, the... The simultaneously, what happened is that the sense of resignation、uh, that we cannot resist anything. しかし、えー、諦めるわけにはいかないんです。すでにもうたくさんの人たちの生活が奪われて、今も奪われ続けているから、えー、何度でも、1年前だろうか、1日前だろうか、始まってからでも、えー、それ以降も世界中で同じようなことが起こっている以上、私たちは黙るわけにはいかないです。We cannot renounce our hope since、uh, the evictions and so, sort of destructions are already happening. And even if the games are started, we have to、uh, continue resisting. Olympic is now, in the short term, in the short term, in the s Less and less cities are not trying not to invite、uh, the future Olympics. 住民投票をした都市では確実にオリンピックを招致しないと決めました。When the、uh, biddings are、uh, happening in those cities, they decided not to invite Olympics. オリンピックはもういらないんです。みんな住民はいらないと考えているんです。The people no longer want Olympics. これからも私たちは1年前でもずっとオリンピックが終わってからも多分声を上げていくでしょう。Uh, even if just one year before the、uh, Tokyo Olympics, we will raise our voice, and even during the Olympics, we will have our own voices. ありがとうございました。Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Hi,、uh, Dave Zirin from The Nation magazine in the United States.、Um, you've given a lot of compelling reasons why people should be very、uh, suspicious of the Olympic Games.、Uh, why do people like Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Casey Wasserman, for example, Mayor Eric Garcetti, why do they want the Olympic Games? I mean, if it's so clear that they cause debt, displacement, and militarization, Why to them are these important social investments in their cities? Thank you for that question. I think the place to start to answer that is to look carefully at who is bidding, who's creating the bids for the Olympics, and who within the political system is supporting those bids. And of course, that tends to be the political and economic elites of each and every Olympic bid city. You don't see homeless folks coming together in prospective Olympic cities and saying, let's bid on the Olympics. This is really going to help us. You don't see poor and working folks getting together and saying, let's bid on the Olympics. This is going to help us. What you see is because of all that money sloshing through the system, you see people who are well connected, political and economic elites, who feel like this is an excellent business opportunity. And so they put their minds together and they put their bids together and they put them forth and they try to put the shiniest shine on them as they can. And so you've seen this in city after city after city. Because let's not make any mistake, despite those trends that I pointed out before. Uh, there are opportunities, if you will, for the Olympics. Not opportunities for everyday people, mind you, but opportunities for those who are well connected to make even more money. So I think if we walk at that、uh, question, thinking about who are the political elites in the city, who are the well connected economic and corporate elites in a city, that gets us well on the road to understanding why, despite this mountain of evidence that has been created over time by、uh, diligent and neutral, neutral social scientists, we still see bids even today. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. you, you, Can I answer as well? Yeah. yeah. I think just to、um, echo what Jules was saying,、uh, you know, this is, this is a question that has come up for us a lot. And、um, 
keeping in mind that people like Casey Wasserman and Eric Garcetti are two of the most privileged, powerful, wealthy people. Um, and similar to, to everyone who was involved in LA's bin in particular, it was folks like Bob Iger, who's the CEO of Disney, Gene Sykes of Goldman Sachs. These are some of the wealthiest and most powerful people on the planet. So they are essentially insulated from any of the effects that we're talking about. They will profit and make money and benefit from the Olympics even if it uh, you know, millions of people lose their homes. Even if the city, uh, you know, goes bankrupt, they will not only be fine, but they will benefit. Uh, it's a question that's come up for us in response to um, the, the myth that the LA 84 games were profitable for LA. Um, the truth is that the LA 84 games had a small surplus, and so when people have asked us, well, didn't those games make money? Um, our response is always, yes, but for who? not for the residents of the city. Not a penny of that money went back to the city of LA. It all went into a private foundation called the LA 84 Foundation that was started and for the first, um, I forget how many years, but for the first several years was managed by Casey Wasserman's wife's grandfather. So this is all an opportunity to keep money and resources and power within a small group of people and sort of to continue to widen that gap that I mentioned earlier. You know, the fact that LA has 60 billionaires and 60,000 homeless people. The Olympics serves to further divert all of those resources, all of that wealth, any, any benefit that would come in for the games would go towards a small group of people and harm a much larger group. え、え、2013年の、え、9月の、ま、え、安倍首相の、え、スピーチから分かるように、え、いろいろなえ、ことをオリンピックは覆い隠すことができる、え、そのような政治、え、プロジェクトだからだと思います。so as we can see uh, from uh, Prime Minister Abe's speech in September 2013, uh, the Olympics can cover up uh, many kinds of things. So on the surface, it seems a peaceful celebration, whereas uh, behind the scenes, there are many uh, devastations and evac uh, evictions. え、先ほどえ、ボイコさんが言ってくださったように、え、グリーンウォッシュ、え、なども言われていますが、え、まさにえ、オリンピックウォッシングえ、そのようにも言えるんじゃないでしょうか。Mr. Baikoff says uh, before that uh, greenwashing uh, is un uh, going around anywhere uh, when the Olympic, where Olympics will be held. But the same thing uh, can be said uh, in 2020 Tokyo. え、この準備段階であらあらゆる破壊と、え、住民のえ、コントロールえ、行い、え、今まで え、民主的な手続きでやってきたことも全てオリンピックのため、え、期限が切れて、デッドラインが決まっている、その日に合わせるために、え、ブルドーザーのごとく全てを、え、民主的な、え、手続きをすっ飛ばして、物事を進めている
So what I mean by Olympic washing is、uh, periodized by this kind of moving moment. この政治を、えー、各都市、えー、まさに民主的な、えー、民主主義、えー、そういったものが崩れていくそういった危機感のある状況が、えー、今各都市で行っているというふうに考えてます。What I think is that democracy we have and we've constructed、uh, have been deteriorated by this big big event. Thank you so much. Thanks. If I may ask a question, please take the other side of the way.、Uh, yes, you, you mentioned all of these negatives, but we, we have to admit that the Olympics、uh, h a s many positives.、Uh, it's a good status for the country, usually, and it promotes the sports.、Uh, we have many、uh, ideals. Uh, the kids want to be like、uh, you know, this sport guy and this sport lady, and they want to improve their、uh, you know, level. And also, the, the Olympics unified the nations, all come to one city and become as one family. That's really good feeling, we cannot deny that. And also, Olympics,、uh, yes, it's、uh, good for business, but what's wrong?、Uh, business needs business, Olympics or anything else, usually.、Uh, and also, Olympics is good opportunities for us, for journalists.、Yeah. Now, the media is having really hard times, and we are happy we can do some you know, extra business in Tokyo. And、uh, also, Olympics, they say it stimulates the economy somehow. That's the, the Pro Olympics people、uh, say that.、Uh, so instead of、uh, you want to scrap the Olympics, why don't you call for reform the Olympics and clean up the Olympics from、uh, all these you know, bad and、uh, corruption things? And that's more realistic than scrapping.、Uh, At all, all the Olympics. I, I think the, the world needs some good events instead of wars. We need some sports, we need some、uh, you know, activists that we, we, we watch it and we enjoy it. So I, I think it is more realistic if you find a little bit uh, uh, better uh, course for that. Thank you. Sorry for long. <laughs> えー、とそうですねあの、とてもエキサイティングするスポーツ観戦は、えーえー、みんなをすごく楽しめることでしょう。So to watch sports games are really, really exciting.、うんえー、その時に、えーまあ、国同士で戦う必要はないと思います。But the thing is that、uh, we do not have to fight among the nations. えー、町の中にやはりあの小さな、えー、スポーツや、えーまあ、本当に小さな、えー、知ってる人たちの中で、えー、スポーツ観戦もしていることでも、えー、楽しめるんじゃないかなと私は思いますし。We have city run facilities where people can enjoy、uh, the sports and you know, a physical、uh, sort of、uh, enjoyment、uh, is everywhere. でやっぱりそのこのとても興奮する、えー、とてもワクワクするというものが、えー、人々の,その競争や、えー、そういったもので、えー、感動したりとかすることそういった欲望自体を、えー、大きな力にコントロールされるということが私たちちょっと怖いと思っていますね。So,、uh, what we fear is、uh, to be controlled,、uh, to, for them to control our desire to enjoy and、uh, to excite and to have a moving moments、uh, from the sports. So, this is a control of the sports. The Olympic is a very important thing. So, this is a very important thing. えー、たくさんあるということを、えー、取材して胸が痛いようなこともたくさんあることもぜひ皆さん、えー、取材してほしいです。So what we see is the intermingling moment of、uh, controlling and being controlled, but among、uh, these intermingling sort of、uh, moments, we also have pains somewhere behind the scenes. 
I've got a long one. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll uh, just say in advance that I have sort of a long response. That was a can of worms. Um, so I guess there's a couple of things to respond to in that. Um, I guess first and foremost, um, I don't think we have to admit that the Olympics have positive benefits. Um, and then to, to respond to a few of those specific claims, uh, you know, starting with one, uh, this idea that it's exciting for children who look up to athletes, that's something we hear a lot in LA, people kind of using the youth um, as, a, as a way of, of kind of, you know, selling the Olympics and selling this positive, shiny image. Um, and I think it's, it's important to understand the actual reality that a lot of children are facing in LA. Um, a lot of the children uh, in my neighborhood, in my community, you know, my, my neighbors, I live in an apartment building in Boyle Heights, which is a predominantly um, working class, immigrant, Latinx community in LA. Uh, those children are don't want to lose their homes. They don't want their parents to be deported. They're not excited about the Olympics. I guarantee you that they would choose uh, they would choose being able to stay in their homes and being able to live with their families and not living under constant threat of, uh, of displacement, whether it's in the form of being deported or evicted, um, than they would the opportunity to like maybe see an athlete. And recognizing, too, that those children will never have a chance to see the Olympic Games. The, the Olympic Games are not for them. Um, they will not be invited. Their families can't afford tickets. Uh, that, you know, so it's, it's not... The games are not good for the children. <laughs> I'll just say that. Uh, also, keeping in mind, speaking of the athletes, uh, you know, and, and the athletes are incredibly exploited. We would count the athletes among the many victims of the Olympic Games. Looking at the number of uh, sexual abuse scandals, including the huge one most recently in the U.S. of, of Larry Nassar and the U.S. Olympic Committee and Michigan State University, which cover, covered up his massive, monstrous. Uh, abuse, violent abuse of women uh, for however many years. Um, so, you know, th this idea of, of the, the Olympics are good because the athletes are good role models for children, I think, on both ends of the spectrum is, is a false premise. Um, the other thing I wanted to address is the idea of, you know, why are, why are we saying no and not asking for reform and the claim that reform is more realistic? What we've seen from history and from working and talking to other organizers in other cities is that reform has consistently failed. There have been many anti-Olympics groups that have tried to negotiate, that have asked for a reform, that have been told that they're going to get reform, and then reform doesn't happen. Uh, and it makes sense, right? Because the IOC, the local politicians, the business interests, I will agree with the one point that you made that this is good business for media. Um, Jules mentioned the other night in his symposium that you know NBC made a record profit for the Rio games while Rio was devastated. So yes, it is, it is good for media and for corporate sponsors. Those are the businesses. It's not local businesses that benefit, to keep in mind. There were a number of businesses that uh, went bankrupt in LA after the LA 84 games and sued the LA organizing committee and won for $40 million. Uh, that's something I believe we saw in Pyeongchang as well, that local businesses went bankrupt. Uh, but keeping in mind, so the people who are driving this have no incentive to reform, and all of the things that we're mentioning, displacement, militarization, environmental degradation, these are not side effects. These are the plan. That's the intention. So they cannot be negotiated away, because that's the purpose. Um, it's not it's not a trade-off uh, so you can't that that is why they are doing it so once again we've seen that reform has failed everywhere that it's been tried and what has worked in many cities in an increasing number of cities is rejection is people coming together and saying no so actually to us saying no is the most realistic plan because that's the only thing that's worked <clears throat> Thank you. I think I appreciate you setting a lot of those ideas on the table for us to take a look at, uh, because I think you you teed up a lot of things that flit through the discussion in the media and elsewhere, and, and we should take a hard look at them. In fact, you actually teed up some things that that are some of the biggest myths around the Olympics. To be honest, um, one of the things we hear a lot is that 
if you host the Olympics, you, you can become a world-class city, have the world's attention on you. But if you look back at some of the recent hosts, I mean, who hasn't heard of Tokyo? Who hasn't heard of Los Angeles? Who hasn't heard of London? Go down the line here. These are already world-class cities. They certainly don't need the Olympics to burnish their reputations. Uh, the idea of uh, unifying different countries, I think you could make an argument for that within the athlete village, uh, which I understand are, are veritable rabbit hutches uh, with all the, uh, the condoms that they leave for the athletes. That's about as close as we get to unifying the nation. I mean, if we look at some of the actual sports battles and certainly how it's portrayed in the press and among the fans, it's really more that the Olympics traffic in a sort of plastic nationalism that rears its head during the Olympic Games. Um, if we're talking about really the question of for whom do the Olympics boom, you're right. It's for the media. You're right. It's for corporations. And uh, Ms. Orchier is right as well, is that a lot of times local companies get boxed out. I've watched this in Olympics after Olympics to get people on board in the beginning we're told that small companies, local companies are going to have a heyday. They're going to make lots of money. You saw it in Los Angeles, 1984, the local companies were kept outside the fence. I mentioned before that I lived in London in 2012, where I interviewed numerous small business owners that were told this was going to be your big chance. Some of them actually went into debt to expand their businesses, only to have nothing of the sort happen with the Olympics and the Olympic tourists. People that study Olympic tourism find that it's a very specific type of tourist. And so they go to specific Olympic events, they stay within the Olympic fences, and they don't go out and visit the locals who are outside the fences because they're not Olympic sponsors. And so oftentimes what happens is the small companies actually get hurt. In fact, one of the people I interviewed who expanded his business, I returned a couple of years later to see how everything was going. He was out of business. He was one metro stop away from the Olympics and told this was going to be his big money maker. It was the exact opposite. I should also mention that the corporations who are the sponsors of the Olympics, when they helicopter in for the games, they get tax breaks. And if they make money, and there is evidence that corporations do make money off the Olympics and Olympic sponsors have a pole position for that, that money tends to leak out of the local economy and back to the corporate headquarters. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's not like the local economy is going to benefit from this. It's going to be a short, short, short term infusion of money into a small, small, small political uh, and geographical space. So I think in terms of the feel good factor that, that you alluded to, it can be real, not for everybody. It can be real for certain, let's be honest, classes of people who have the privilege to enjoy it. I happen to be of th those classes. So when I lived in London, I got to ride the subway and see people with their flags and their uniforms and people talking. And, and there's definitely, it felt good. It wasn't like London usually where we're all looking down at, at our mobile phones or reading the newspaper. Um, but again, it's fleeting. And who wins from that? A certain group of people, and it's a very classed group of people. Uh, finally, on, on the notion of reform, uh, there's lots of things that the Olympics could certainly do to reform, uh, and I have many ideas for that, notwithstanding Ms. Orche's uh, important point that hasn't got a lot of traction, some of these pleas for reform in the past. Um, but if you really want to get serious about Olympic reform, you could just simply just focus on the Olympic village for a second. Because in Olympics after Olympics after Olympics, we're told that the Olympic village is going to be the space for everyday people to live after the Olympics. Not Rio, where it was going to be a space exclusively for the rich, we were told from the outset. At least there was a little bit of truth to that. In Vancouver and London, on the other hand, we, we were told there was going to be a social housing component, when in reality, once money got tight, and in the case of uh, Vancouver, the private company that was running and making the Olympic Village went belly up, it went out of business, and the federal government had to step in, and the, and the Vancouver government had to step in and basically nationalize the project. Uh, we, we've seen time and again big promises, but again, the follow through is lacking. And then once that happens and the government comes in, also happened in London, then they're like, well, look, we can't have social housing. We need to make our money back. We weren't even expecting to put all this money into this Olympic Village project. So if, if one were serious, and, and I doubt and with a lot of people that they're serious about reforming the games to help everyday people, if they were, they could start with the Olympic Village and talk about how to make it into an equitable space after the Olympic Games. That's just one tiny, tiny sliver of what we're talking about, but it would be a chance for people who are serious about reform to show just a shred of goodwill.
Thank you. I would like to make an announcement. There was audio problem on our live, uh, live streaming service. Uh, we broadcast this event uh, through live streaming internet, so we had audio problem. Uh, there was, uh, there's no audio. Uh, I would like to apologize uh, on behalf of Press Club for this uh, inconvenience. It has caused uh, some uh, people who were watching us. We are sorry about that. Thank you. I think we uh, reached the time, but I would like to allow a very small question. If, if any of you have a short question, we can give. Yes? Yeah. Hi, Spike Friedman, Pace Magazine. Uh, my question is with media, how have you seen the media cover these events in these bidding processes in the past? And what do you see, especially given the conflicts of interest you were talking about in terms of media growth, the potential future for media involvement in the Olympic process? What would you like to see in that regard? <laughs> Um, okay, I guess I can start while, uh, uh, so yeah, I guess just to, to recap the question a little bit, what, what has media coverage of the process looked like and what would we like to see in the future? Is that right? Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, media coverage, and, and I guess to back up a little bit, the media landscape in Los Angeles is, uh, very interesting right now. It's a very interesting time. Um, we have, for one of the biggest cities in the world, we have one newspaper in Los Angeles. There's one newspaper. Um, we have one newspaper, two public radio stations, um, and then a few independent outlets. And one of the things that we've seen happening um, over the last few years is as uh, you know, the media, you know, a journalist, journalistic business model is struggling. Um, a lot of real estate investors and speculators, the same interests that are invested in bringing the Olympics to LA have bought these outlets and have financial stakes in these media outlets as well. Um, and that, as you can imagine, impacts coverage. So for example, uh, the, the new owner of the Los Angeles Times, our one paper for our giant city, uh, is it owns a number of, of sports stadiums and is has investments in sports media companies and so you know that is something that we think in our group uh, has affected the coverage we think it should be something that's made public that the the paper should acknowledge when they're writing about it um, you know for example one some of the people who are being displaced right now by rising rents and gentrification live in Inglewood which is a city in the county of Los Angeles um, and they they're building a giant new stadium there and and folks are being driven out in droves as we speak and the way that the LA Times covers this is to basically a lot of times list a lot of these myths and talk about how good the stadium is for, for the local economy and fails to mention that the owner of the paper has a financial interest in this stadium. Uh, we also see this, there's another outlet in a, well, Curbed is a national website and publication, um, but the, the company that owns Curbed, Casey Wasserman, who we've mentioned, the chair of LA 2028, he's on the board. And so, you know, that, that's something we have friends who worked for Curb, a number of people in our group are journalists. Uh, Curb primarily covers real estate. So for example, they were covering the sale of Casey Wasserman's house because it was such a historic, uh, huge figure that he was selling it for. And some of them off the record mentioned to us that it was a very strange process having to write about the political implications of, you know, somebody, uh, somebody's wealth who is effectively has control over whether or not you as a journalist get fired or keep your job. And so that's something we've been seeing in an ongoing way, these kind of massive conflicts of interest. Uh, the LA Times has sponsored um, has sponsored events that the LA 84 Foundation has hosted. We've asked them about this. They they sort of often have these like backdoor reasons that it's, it's okay and it's not a conflict of interest. Um, but again, we, we see the results play out and how things are covered. 
So I think in terms of what we would like to see, um, primarily we would just like an independent media <laughs> that is not owned by real estate investors uh, and, and to allow journalists to basically actually report on what's happening. We would like to see the people who are being affected in every way be at the center of this, these stories um, and be allowed to tell their own stories. I think one of the things that's most personally distressing to me is, is when... Um, and this is something I've seen everywhere, not just in LA, is when the media tends to report on the devastation of the Olympics or the devastations of gentrification. Um, even when the stories are ostensibly sympathetic, they still sort of position the people being affected as victims and not focus on the organizing work. Um, I think that's something we're hearing from the folks who went to Fukushima yesterday. Uh, I had no idea that people in Fukushima were resisting and organizing. That's not a story that the media covers. Um, so I, I think, again, changing who is a, a subject and who has agency in these stories is really important. Um, being hyper aware and honest about conflicts of interest and, and economic interests in terms of how things is, are reported is really important. And that extends beyond the Olympics. That extends to pretty much every issue that affects our lives and communities. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> そうですね。招致段階からあなかなか、えー、オリンピック、えー、の問題というよりは、えー、ちょうど2013年は、えー、私たち、えー、日本でのスポーツの中における暴力問題が浮上した時でした。So 2013 was the year Uh, when the,、uh, the issue of violence、uh, was raised、uh, in the sports world. Judo, the national team, was not a very good team. It was a very good team. It was a very good team. 暴力体質が明るみに出たと思います。So、uh, it means that a female national team of、uh, judo、uh, exposed、uh, courageously what they have been done by the coaches and the、uh, committees. そういった状態でオリンピックを招致できる、招致するとは私たち自身、えー、思わなかったと思います。So, Because of that, we didn't expect that、uh, the Japan will really invite、uh, the future Olympics. So, it's a big part of the country's strength. It's a big part of the So, of course, media coverage has huge power to the minds of the people because when the Olympics were decided, people's attention was sort of directed just to that. So, it means that they have to cover everything behind the scenes. ローカルなあの市民メディアもすごく、えー、頑張って、えー、本当の声を、えー、<笑>救い上げようとしているので私たちはその人たちとも連携しつつ、えー、大手のメディアとも、えー、ぜひとも報道してほしいと思っています。Meanwhile, the independent local medias are really cooperative for us and they cover、uh, what is happening、uh, behind the scenes.、Uh, but we also hope that uh, uh, big media uh, companies uh, will also、uh, broadcast and cover what is happening behind the scenes as well. Thank you. <coughs> You have anything? Just real quick. I mean, at the risk of sounding obsequious, I would say that the media, which is to say journalists, are a key linchpin in how the Olympic juggernaut rolls forward or doesn't. And the media coverage of the Olympics has changed pretty drastically over time. There's a lot of critical coverage these days, especially when the Olympic Games are down the road. What I'll be keeping a close eye on as we move forward 
is how media, especially local media here in Japan and in Tokyo in particular, cover the Olympics the closer they get. Do we see space for being critical now, but it evaporates as the games get closer, even though the issues don't evaporate? That has been a trend in the past, and that's something that I'll be keeping an eye on as we move forward. Thanks. I would like to allow another last question. <laughs> Short, very short one. Thank you. Uh, Joseph, uh, my name is Haruna Honkop from the Czech Republic, filmmaker. Uh, I would like to follow up the question on reform. Uh, although it seems to all of you that it's not possible uh, to reform the Olympics, but how about if the, the Olympics came to, to its origins, meaning they would be held at one place? Uh, or if you can comment very quick, like how the mobility of the Olympic Games is influencing uh, the, the whole uh, movement. Thank you. So I think the subtext of the question is maybe having the Olympics return to Athens, return to Greece potentially. People have mentioned that as one option. It's, it's um, not clear that the people of Athens really want the Olympics at this point, given what happened last time in 2004. Uh, we still see stadiums over, overcome with weeds today from those 2004 Olympics, despite the grand promises. I think the idea of a rotating city Olympics has a little bit more traction these days. So you have a handful of four or five cities for the Winter Olympics, four or five cities for the Summer Olympics, and you just rotate and you have it move around the globe. That sounds okay in, in the abstract, but when you start thinking about it in the specific, it doesn't necessarily hold up, especially now that you think about new stadiums that are built are only new for so long. I come to you from the United States, where in Atlanta they made a brand new stadium for the 1996 Olympics. They rubbled it, which is to say they demolished it uh, 20 years later. And so by the time the games would have rotated back around to Atlanta, they would have needed a new a, a stadium anyway. So it doesn't really get at some of the dynamics that we've been talking about in terms of building, in terms of demolition, in terms of getting rid of particular communities. So it's definitely a conversation that should be had, and probably that's a step in the right direction, uh, but it doesn't necessarily solve the problems in a, in a direct way as one might seem just on the surface. Thank you very much. Just a clarif clarification. How many members uh, are in your group? Do you have a number? Like uh, 50,000, 10,000? We have hundreds or 200 of people in uh, street demonstration. え、でももう反対してる人は多分住民の人はすごく多いと思います。もううんざりだと思ってる人はもうほとんどだと思います。But uh, talk and uh, we would like to thank everybody for coming today and uh, please give our speakers special applause for their presentation thank you very much thank you